we had a slight glitch in our wireless signal, so um, we're back and um, Sue is going into detail about some of our cases. Right, and so Juvenile Law Center uses a variety of strategies uh, to address all the issues that we work on on behalf of youth in the justice system and the child welfare system, um, in both instances focusing on adolescents, on older youth. Um, but uh, litigation is what I think we uniquely bring to the table. So while with our colleagues we, we write, we publish, we train, we conduct webinars, we issue reports, we draft legislation, we draft regulations, um, all of those are important. And, and as you know, we use strategic communications as well. Uh, but litigation is uh, a tool that we bring to the table and I think our, our long 42 year history of our excellence in litigation really adds kind of credibility and reputation to all of the work that we do. Uh, and so right now, as I mentioned uh, before the signal went bad, we have uh, just under 50 cases in 18 states and one of those cases is a class action suit in Wisconsin. Uh, we are where we're co-counseling with Quarles and Brady uh, and as local pro bono counsel and the ACLU of Wisconsin. And that case really began um, to ban the abusive use of solitary confinement in two uh, facilities, one for girls and one for boys in Wisconsin. And as we got into discovery and learning more about the cases, it became clear that there was a lot of abusive conditions and that included the indiscriminate use of strip searches, some of them in public areas, um, the use of pepper spray to, uh, to manage traffic flow and behavior and all kinds of things. Um, and so all of those abusive conditions have now been part of the suit and we do have a preliminary injunction from the federal judge uh, in that case and trial is set in July. But that's just one of the 50 or so cases that we have right now. The others are mostly appellate work. And so in much of the appellate work, we bring a unique voice um, and uh, we serve as a friend of the court by filing an amicus brief and perhaps organizing the amicus brief effort. In other cases, we partner on the appeal itself as the counsel of record. And many of those cases right now, the active cases are juvenile life without parole cases uh, when the Montgomery v. Louisiana case came down in January 2016, um, it meant that 2,000 individuals uh, who were sent, who were serving life without parole for crimes committed as juveniles, who had not been given a resentencing hearing after the 2012 decision, uh, were now eligible for a resentencing hearing because Montgomery said that the decision was retroactive. And so the 2012 decision was retroactive. And so in those states, including Pennsylvania, Louisiana, Michigan, where the states had not found the 2012 decision to be retroactive, all of these cases now needed resentencing. So there's about 2,000 across the nation, 500 here in Pennsylvania, about 325 here in Philadelphia. So we're ground zero here in Philadelphia, and we've been very actively involved um, at every level, including some arguments in the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania where we've gotten favorable rulings about the processes and the standards to be used by the court. So we've had um, a lot of involvement in other juvenile life without parole resentencing hearings um, across the country and that's a big part of our case law, our caseload right now along with um, transfer cases, uh, trying to use the adolescent brain science which was so successful in educating the court around the uniqueness of the developmental stage of adolescence and how it should force us then to think differently about uh, crimes committed and the ability for rehabilitation um, for youth uh, in, that, in that time of life. And so we're challenging trans automatic transfer of youth to adult court. Um, uh, we have cases around expungement of records, sex offender registration, um, in our child welfare work, uh, the law now allows for youth to stay in the foster care system or to re-enter the foster care system to age 21. And so in instances where youth are wrongly denied the ability to stay in care or to re-enter care, we're participating in some of those cases. So we have a very wide um, and active caseload. And as I say, that's just 
one of the tools that we used that we use. Um, just last week, we had a convening with experts uh, in Washington, D.C., experts from all around the country to talk about sex offender registration for juveniles. So we called it our SORNA convening. The SORNA is Sex Offender Registration and Notification Act. Um, and research is increasingly showing that uh, registration of youthful offenders, not only does it make the public safer, it not only does not make the public safer, but actually puts the child at risk of predatory behavior because their name is known uh, and uh, adults, offenders, um, are, are preying on these youth. Uh, and we know that well over 90% of the youth who offend um, as an adolescent will not reoffend as an adult, but being on a sex offender registration has lifelong consequences in terms of their education, their housing, their employability. So it's, it's, a, it's an issue that needs to be dealt with much more thoughtfully and much more carefully, really paying attention to what the evidence shows us. Uh, and so Juvenile Law Center is leading that effort and hosted the convening at the offices of Baker and McKenzie down in Washington, D.C. just last week. Um, I think going forward, of course, the cases that we have will continue. Some of them will wind up, but between now and January 20th, we have five briefs uh, due in state Supreme Courts across the country, and so the cases that we have are cases that will continue into the new year, um, as will much of our work. We've engaging, engage, we are engaging in a new project uh, with Pepper Hamilton here in Philadelphia to update our expungement, um, our, our records uh, website, which deals with the laws in all 50 states and, and how one goes about expunging a juvenile record and how states are doing in implementing um, that expungement availability. So that's a big project that will be taking place uh, next year um, we're working on um, a host of conditions work in, uh, around juvenile justice facilities and also working with partners around exploring conditions in aggregate care facilities, so group home settings in the foster care system. So as much as uh, it's uh, very um, difficult to hear about some of the conditions for youth in the juvenile justice system, perhaps even more ignored and hidden are some of the conditions for youth in group home settings in the child welfare system. Uh, and so that's just one area where we're taking kind of a fresh look with partners from around the country. And I know that we are on the cusp of launching a campaign in the next 10 days. Yeah. So um, I would love you to talk a little about our, um, starting tomorrow, our 10 right. days to raise campaign. Right, so tomorrow's uh, December 21st and between December 21st and December 31st, we have our 10 days to raise, uh, where uh, some longtime supporters of Juvenile Law Center, the Krigalskis, have very generously provided a matching gift so that anyone who donates to us in the last 10 days of the fiscal year will have their donation matched. Um, the Krigalskis first became supporters of Juvenile Law Center when they heard about our work in the Kids for Cash scandal. Um, so the Kids for Cash scandal was uh, the Luzerne County um, uh, scandal where judges on the family court bench had received large sums of money from a developer of a juvenile prison um, and had reported those funds and then youth who appeared before the court were waiving counsel and being sentenced to long terms in those facilities, kind of regardless of the offense. And Juvenile Law Center covered it, represented all of the youth to expunge their records, to um, end their sentences. It involved over 2,000 kids and, and millions of dollars had transferred hands. And so the Krigulskis were from Luzerne County, where this horror took place, uh, and on Christmas Eve, uh, about 10 years ago, called Juvenile Law Center to see how they could help, and they've been uh, supporters ever since. And so when we reached out to them, they were very supportive of this idea. And I, I think this is a time where a lot of people are saying, like, what can we do? How can we help? And uh, 
this is a way that you can help times two, right? You can make a donation that you're, that you're comfortable with and it gets doubled by other people who said, Juvenile Law Center, we've known you for a long time. How can we help? And so we ask them to provide these matching funds. Okay. And so folks are, if you're interested in participating, um, you can go to our website, www.jlc.org. We also have a donate option through our Facebook page. Um, so please also consider signing up for our email list at our website as well. And thanks so much, Sue. No, thanks, Katie. Um, yeah, thanks for tuning in.